point, and I hope any, so. Any kids his age? Uh, no, no, just a couple of adults. And actually, it's someone who um, was just diagnosed with breast cancer oh, and no. three weeks ago. And ever since then, she said that she's just been saying, I got to go see Dr. Tom. I got to see Dr. Tom because they had been here before at this place where we live. And, and uh, so we just uh, had a hour conversation, uh, no holds barred as to what she has to do. And so really valuable, really valuable. It's a case of someone who is squeaky clean, gluten-free and calorie counting and very little carbs, not quite keto, but almost. And she weighs 320 pounds and she doesn't cheat at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. Well, sorry to interrupt, Michelle and Dr. Tom. We are live. Yeah, we okay. are live. We are live. <laughs> all right. It's uh, uh, four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, midnight, uh, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin and London. Um, and most of Europe, if not all of Europe, I, th I think it is all of Europe now, 4.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in India, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, 11.30 a.m. in New Zealand, and it's Facebook Live. Hello, everyone. And this is the time of the month where I get to hang out with Michelle Ross. And uh, we get, yay, and, and we take your questions. So hello, Michelle, it's nice to see you again. Hi, Dr. Tom, it's great to see you. So this is your session, everyone, just to fire your questions away. And I'm gonna start with one that I didn't get to last week. And that was Lisa on Instagram saying, hair thinning, is it reversible? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, uh, there are many triggers and the key is to find out what's triggering the inflammation. And Michelle, I know you remember well the case study I've done so many times on presentations, a guy, 44 year old guy who was um, diagnosed with alopecia, meaning losing his hair. And it was a heliobacter infection, a bug in his gut. And when they gave him the antibiotics for his gut for four or six weeks, his hair started growing back. And in six months, he had a full flock of hair. And we just show you the pictures. And uh, it doesn't mean that hair thinning is a heliobacter problem. It's an inflammation problem. So the question is, where is the inflammation coming from? Michelle, any, anything you want to add to that about hair thinning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're just spot on. You got to find the root cause. Yeah. Find the root cause of that inflammation. And uh, we have a, another question that I didn't get to last week from Nancy on Zoom. Nancy, I hope you're here. I've had progressive myopia since a child and got double vision a few years ago, been gluten-free and on amino acids. What test should I take? Michelle, do you wanna start with that one? Uh, full functional blood chemistry and wheat sumer, <laughs> always wheat sumer. Yes, yes. The, the question, Nancy, is, where is the inflammation coming from? It doesn't matter what the symptoms are. Of course, the short-term symptom relief protocols different are different for any condition, but to get to put this thing into remission and to stop the pr progression of whatever dis-ease or disease you have, you have to identify where's the inflammation coming from. And that's the million dollar question that um, uh, I think is becoming more and more recognized um, as the primary approach to take. Uh, more and more studies are coming out talking about that kind of thing. And, and so irrespective of what the symptomatology is, if it's chronic, remember 14 of the top 15 causes of death in the world today are chronic inflammatory diseases. The only one that's not is unintentional injuries. So everything that takes us down in the top 15 causes of death are inflammation, chronic inflammation conditions. So the question is, where is the inflammation coming from? So from that perspective, uh, Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? 
Yes, I just am finding with almost everyone I work with that they either have hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia or hyperinsulinemia. So what does that mean? <laughs> okay. Good, good question, Dr. Tom. So they either have elevated blood sugar, blood sugar maybe is spiking throughout the day, or they blood sugar is dropping too low, or insulin is too high. So one of my favorite things is for people to wear a continuous glucose monitor. And this is something that you can get by prescription, or you can actually get it over the counter now. And it has these two sections. You download an app on your phone. You can buy something that actually does all the tracking, but for free, you can get the app for free. You connect these together. You open them back both up, pop it into the back of your arm. It makes this loud noise and you think I should be experiencing pain and you feel nothing <laughs> and you think what just happened. Um, so you don't even feel the needle going in your arm. It lasts for two weeks and it's going to provide such invaluable information about which foods, which stressful activities during your day are dysregulating your blood sugar. Critically, critically important concept. And now it's becoming more commonly available. Well, a year ago, it was prescription only, and there was a waiting list to get these things. Now, other companies have come on board, and they're manufacturing them, and they're, uh, I think the cost has gone down a little bit, and you don't need a prescription anymore. And so when you put this patch on, it's like a nicotine patch, but it's not putting something into you. Rather, it's just measuring what your blood sugar. And so you eat breakfast. You have some scrambled eggs, a couple pieces of bacon and a slice of gluten-free toast with some butter on it. And an hour later, you look on your phone and you see your blood sugar spiked. And you said, oh my gosh, what was that? Why is my blood sugar spiking? That was such a good breakfast. What is it? And then you'll figure it out because you'll see as you check this after every meal and in the middle of the afternoon when you've not eaten, because you, you can measure it 24 mm seven -hmm. on, on this app and you see what your blood sugar regulating system is doing right now. So irrespective of how good a food or a meal is for you in your head or in our heads, irrespective, you're going to see exactly what it's doing in your body right now. And you can't argue with that. You know, there's, there's no argument with that because this is real time measurements of how your current lifestyle is affecting your blood sugar. And you find that your blood sugar is great most of the day, everything's great, and then your husband comes home from work and your blood sugar spikes. Well, that's the emotional side of the pyramid of health that might have to be addressed, right? So, yes. but you'll, you'll find out where the triggers are and what your, where your symptoms are coming from. Absolutely. Uh, Christina says, greetings from from Cartago. Hello, Christina. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dominic on Facebook is asking, what do you recommend to find the root cause of, uh, it says information, but I think you mean inflammation. What do you recommend? Michelle, do, do you want to start with that? How, how do you approach finding the root cause of inflammation? Yes. Yeah, so great question. And I think the most important um, saying that we say all the time, Dr. Thomas, tests don't guess. So we need to know what your biochemistry is telling us. And on the doctor.com website, there's a full functional blood chemistry panel with all of the recommended markers. I have yet to have a conventional doctor that's willing to order all of those. And it's not because they don't want to, it's because insurance companies require diagnostic codes. So important markers like homocysteine, they aren't able to create a diagnostic code until after somebody has a heart attack to rationalize that you need that. And a lot of insurance companies right now aren't willing to pay for vitamin D, a critically important marker for every single one of us right now that's listening. And for <laughs> Anne and Dr. Tom and myself, it's just a marker that should be done at least annually. 
And um, so I think that that is one of the best places to start because it provides so much information. I talked to somebody today and her CBC with diff, a very, very inexpensive panel. This can definitely be ordered by any doctor, any practitioner, um, indicated that she likely has high viral load. So there's a lot of information that you can get from a urinalysis, from a comp metabolic panel, from a CBC with diff, from these critically important um, blood sugar markers, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, insulin, and I really like to add on glycomark. Glyco, hemoglobin A1C is like a three month average of your blood sugar, but glycomark indicates if you were having blood sugar spikes in the last two weeks. So it's a much better marker to like monitor ongoing. If, if your glycomark is below 10, it likely means you are having blood sugar spikes above 180. And really we wanna keep your blood sugar in the sweet spot of between 80 and 120. And those are US measurements. I know other countries measure um, glucose in a different way, but that's really ideal. You don't want it to be spiking above 120, definitely not above 140, definitely not at 180. Now there's gonna be times, Dr. Tom, that Geo has a birthday and maybe you have birthday cake and maybe your blood sugar spikes to 180. And this happens infrequently, right? Um, we want blood sugar resilience, right? We want it to come right back down. We don't want it to stay elevated. So there's, we're all going to have times when our blood sugar is gonna spike. We just don't wanna be doing that on the daily. Right, right, exactly right. So if you are doing a glycomark, which is a measure of about a two week interval of your spiking and crashing and spiking and crashing, and if it comes back irregular, that's a really good indicator. Oh man, I need to put some time into monitoring my blood sugar on a daily basis to see where am I messing up? How am I messing up? Because if you're trying to be squeaky clean and, but here's the result, then you're missing something. And that's when the patch is a great idea mm -hmm. for 24 seven monitoring yourself for a couple of weeks. And you don't feel it, you, you can take a shower with it, it's just fine. Mm -hmm. But the result is you'll be able to see what your food selections are doing to you on a very regular basis. So important. Yes, critically important. Uh, I'm trying to find, um, on my phone, uh, Facebook for this group. I can't find it. I don't know where it is because I know people are making comments and stuff mm -hmm. and I can't see them. So Anne will post the questions here uh, for us. Uh, I, I, I can't find them on the phone. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm going to go over a couple of questions that have come up for me uh, recently. Uh, first one from Carla on YouTube. Are natural foods for panic attacks and heart palpitation, oh, any, any natural foods for panic attacks and heart palpitations. Michelle, how, how would you start with that one? So if somebody's having panic attacks, um, there definitely can be, if anything is out of whack with your health, think diet, right? Which is then you're gonna think blood sugar. But I have yet to meet anyone who's, um, unwell or diet isn't playing a role. So if you have vibrant health, then likely the diet you're eating is keeping you vibrantly healthy. But if you have any symptoms, you have to look at diet. It's critically important. And there's some key foods, sugar, processed foods, gluten, which negatively impacts every human that eats it for a minimum of 30 minutes, it causes intestinal permeability, but potentially up to five hours. Dairy, cow dairy is a cross-reactive food. It can trick your body into thinking it's still getting exposed. Corn. Now there's 200 sources of corn in our food supply. And most people are not eating organic heirloom corn on the cob. They're eating some processed form of corn that is a disaster to your blood sugar. So soy can be really problematic. Almost all soy in the United States is genetically modified. So there's some key foods, lectins for some people can be really problematic. So I recommend the Zoomer bundle. 
um, the vibrant wellness zoomer bundle for like the top six foods. So it's typically wheat zoomer, lectin zoomer, corn, dairy, soy, and egg. Those are the foods that I see are the most problematic. If you can afford to do all 11, awesome. But if money's a little bit tighter, those I feel like are going to contribute the most dramatically to lowering the inflammatory load in your body. Excellent. Excellent. And I, I fully agree with that. Uh, as Michelle said earlier, the rule is test don't guess that you have to find out what are the triggers that are contributing to my inflammation. And the most common source of those triggers is what's on the end of your fork. So finding out which foods are a problem is of critical importance when you're wanting to reduce your inflammatory um, cascade, the amount of inflammation in your body. Uh, Carlo, food is either, food is either contributing to disease or reversing disease. There's really no middle ground. Amen to that. Yeah, there's, there's no neutrals when it comes mm -hmm. to food. The only neutral, healthy neutral is water. Water is the only thing, and, but clean water mm -hmm. is, is a neutral. Uh, you, you, your body doesn't react to clean water. It passes through with diffusion. But if there's toxins in the water, if there's chemicals in the water, then it's a whole different ball game. And so you always want to be conscious that the healthiest water that you can drink is your tap water after it's gone through a great water filtration system. And the one downside to that, a great water filtration system includes reverse osmosis, which gets out all the metals like lead and mercury, but it also gets out the minerals. So there's no calcium or magnesium in reverse osmosis water. So you have to make sure that you're taking a supplement on a daily basis that's supplying you with your minerals. And as long as you're doing that, then it's the safest, cleanest water that you can drink. It is your tap water gone through a good um, water filtration system. Absolutely, Dr. Tom. Um, let's see. Jane Beth, on Zoom, or you want to go for that? You go ahead. I'm on no, you go ahead. Okay. go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Jane um, on Zoom, her question is which genetic test or what genetic testing do you recommend? I'll let you start with that one. So I think that genetic testing is still a bit of the wild, wild west. So um, I know that like 23andMe um, has a discount right now and I don't know what they do with that information. I mean, we know that they use it to harass people, right? But there are people that use like a, a anonymous <laughs> name and email address and they order that. And so it has some good basic markers. Uh, there's some other uh, companies out there that I think um, are pretty good, but I think that we there's not one test I know right off the bat that is like the standard. I typically add celiac genetics on. I really like um, testing for ApoE4 and those are markers that can be ordered through Vibrant. But um, let's talk of, about that for a minute. The ApoE4, okay. I think that's a good one to talk about. That's the Alzheimer's gene. And what does it mean if you have an ApoE4? See, you, you get one from your mother and one from your father and you, you get either a two, a three or a four. So it's called APO, A-P-O, capital E, two, APO, E, three, APO, E, four. You get one from your mother, one from your father. So you can be a two, 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 three, two, four, three, 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 four, or four, four. Those are the only options. APO, E, four is the Alzheimer's gene. And if you have one, you the risk of Alzheimer's is increased substantially. If you have two, it's increased dramatically. But that doesn't mean you're getting Alzheimer's. It means that's the weak link in your chain. And I love when my patients come back positive to APOE4 because then I get to read to them from the book. You know what I say? I'm going to read to you from the book of life right now. If you don't pay attention to this for the rest of your life and monitor this, you very likely are going to be a blithering idiot in your 80s. And they look at me, I say, I'm sorry, 
but let's just, you know, I want to talk to you the way I would want to be talked to, meaning I want the truth here. And if you carry an APOE4, you need to monitor at least once a year, once every two years, the markers of inflammation in your brain. And as long as you keep the markers of inflammation in your brain to a minimum, then don't worry about it. You're not going to manifest, you're not killing off brain cells. You kill off brain cells when you have high inflammation in the brain. And if you have high inflammation and you're an APOE2-2, very unlikely that you're going to get Alzheimer's. You've, you've got this protection that the inflammation will manifest somewhere else, maybe as cardiovascular disease, maybe as cancer, but not as Alzheimer's. But if you carry one or two APOE4s and your inflammation is pulling at the chain and the weak link in your chain is your brain, and there may be other weak links, but that's a weak link in your brain. So Mrs. Patient, these are the tests that you have to do on an annual basis until they're normal. Then maybe you do it every two years, maybe even every three years, as long as you have repeat normals. But the first one is the Neural Zoomer Plus. That's the one test I recommend to everyone is that they do. I don't care what symptoms they come in with. I recommend the Wheat Zoomer Neural Zoomer Plus because it gives us so much information. And the brain is the canary in the coal mine, meaning the symptoms will show up there before they show up in other areas most of the time. So you do the Neural Zoomer Plus. It comes back and there's problems. Great, this is what we're gonna deal with. Let's look at why this is happening. This is a test result we're looking at here uh, for the Neural Zoomer Plus. And this person has a uh, number of markers, the two columns on the left that are positive and moderate says, your brain's on fire. And they may say, well, I feel fine. Well, it doesn't matter how you feel. By the time you feel it, you've got a real problem. But this means you've got elevated antibodies to all of those different markers. So you do the Neural Zoomer Plus and you begin to explore how do I get those markers down? And then you recheck yourself in six months or a year. That's a doctor's choice or a clinician's choice as to when to recheck. Don't do it before six months. It's, uh, I think it's a waste of money because it takes three, four months to get these markers down. Once you get the lifestyle habits down, once you identify where's the inflammation that's pulling on the chain, it's gonna take a number of months to get these antibodies down. So save your money, don't recheck for at least six months. And when it comes back, if the first time, the one that Michelle just showed us, I think there was nine markers there. I didn't count them, but it looked like it was about nine that were elevated. So in six months, you do it and there are four markers elevated. And you'll say, oh, this isn't working. What I'm doing is not working. No, it's working. You got almost 50% of them down. Way to go. Keep it up. Now let's see if there's anything else we're missing in here. And then you might tweak the protocol a little bit and then you check it in another six months. And once it gets down in the, into the normal range, then you check it once a year. And when you've got normals for maybe two years in a row, then maybe you can go every two years, but you check it for the rest of your life because mm -hmm. you're an APOE4 and something you may be doing or you, your basement may have flooded last year, you cleaned it up, but there's mold down there. And now you're breathing mold every day, but you can't smell it. And that's causing the inflammation in your brain. You'd never know unless you're checking your brain inflammation markers on a regular basis. Michelle, do you want to add to that? Well, I want to um, finish up with her question so that we can keep adding to that. So she says, which inflammatory markers do you recommend checking? So that's there's more information that we can discuss with this. So the two that are the basic Markers of generalized inflammation that any doctor can order are C-reactive protein. I recommend doing the high sensitivity or the cardiac C-reactive protein, um, but any C-reactive protein will give you information. And um, sedimentation rate. You really want that sedimentation rate um, around three. And the reference range is, I think, goes up to 28. 
but above three is really indicating system-wide inflammation. C-reactive protein, we really ideally want at zero, but I think less than one is considered normal. So those would be the two basic, but the neural zoomer plus, and then gut zoomer. So it has a very impressive intestinal permeability, uh, I mean, inflammatory panel. So eight markers of gut inflammation, there's no other test on the market that test all eight in one report. Most of them only test um, calprotectin. What do you see usually, Dr. Tom? Sometimes they'll do lactoferrin and calprotectin, but I haven't seen any other panel that addresses this. This is a gut on fire. I've, I've seen um, uh, a test that we started doing back in the 90s, actually, which was from Genova, had calprotectin, fecal lactoferrin, and eosinophil X. So okay. there, there were three, but nothing is as comprehensive as this. It's looking at seven markers of inflammation in the gut. This is the most comprehensive one I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And then the wheat zoomer, which we talk about um, on repeat because it's so important. These markers, LPS antibodies are so critically important. And there's a really great slide where you can see here LPS leading to an inflammatory cascade outside of the gut. So there's other markers like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, um, that are more advanced markers of inflammation that I don't think are tests that just should be run out of the gate, right? Because there's an unlimited number of testing, but most of us don't have unlimited budgets. So I think it's really important to invest in what's gonna give you the most information. I wouldn't likely run these unless somebody is, you know, maybe advanced Lyme or like in a really serious state, or maybe we're having trouble, you know, figuring out the LPS, right? And they, and we need to go a little bit deeper, but those are more advanced markers, but it's just, I wanted to show you that picture because it's just such a good <laughs> Yeah, let's visual. stay on that picture for a yeah. minute. So the first thing about LPS, it stands for lipopolysaccharide, and it means the exhaust of bad bacteria in your gut. Everybody knows if you exercise too hard and your muscles sore the next day, it's lactic acid, which is the exhaust of your muscle cells. Well, your bacteria in the gut produce exhaust, and the good bacteria produce exhaust. It's called metabolites. Over one third of all the small molecules in your bloodstream are the metabolites from the bacteria in your gut. Over one third of everything in your bloodstream. They're the messengers that tell the brain how to work and the heart how to work and the liver how to work. They're the messengers. Now, if you have too many bad guys in your gut, the exhaust from the bad guys is called LPS, lipopolysaccharides, which means they're messengers of inflammation. And when they get in the bloodstream, one, over one third of all the small molecules in the bloodstream are the exhaust of the gut. If you have too many bad guys in the gut, the exhaust is bad guy exhaust. That gets into the bloodstream and it creates inflammation in your brain, inflammation in your joints, inflammation anywhere in your body. So LPS is not a friendly thing to have around. And it is the cause the accumulated LPS is the cause of what some people have heard of before, sepsis. That sepsis is just accumulated LPS that's been accumulating over the years. My mother died of sepsis. I know this one pretty well. And unfortunately, I was too late and my mother... <laughs> I bought my mother a water filtration system for her house because the water out there is bad chlorine and everything. She would take one gallon plastic jugs and go to my sister's house and fill them up and bring them home to make her coffee and to drink water because she likes the taste of chlorine. That, <laughs> that was my mother. Right? <laughs> so, but she, she died of sepsis. And so I, I know this one and it's tender to my heart. 1.7 million people a year in the U.S., um, get sepsis, of which over a quarter of a million of them die. It's the number one cause of death of elders in hospitals is sepsis. And it's just accumulated LPS has been building up over years. 
So when you do this test in your 20s or 30s or 40s, and you see that you've got elevated LPS antibodies that your body is fighting this thing, then that gives you, and let's stay on this picture for a minute. Yeah, right there. Because I wanted to point out that this is a comparative report. Over on the right side was the first test this person did. And you see they had elevated LPS. It's got a red circle around it there. And then the follow-up test was down in the normal range. They went from 61 in May of 2018 to 8.7 whenever the follow-up test, oh, wait a minute, when was that follow-up test done? Um, in in uh, uh, August of 2000, no, that's not Oh, that's right. their birthday. I don't think we yeah. have a date on it because it's just a okay. sample report. Okay, but, but that's an example of what you see when you do follow-up tests. You see, wow, all right, this is much better. Great, all right, what, what we're doing is working. Or you'll see, oh, looks like we need to tweak this a little bit more. That's why you do the test, is to confirm that your protocols are working. That's why you do the follow-up test. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next question. What are your opinions on bioresonance testing for sensitivities? Uh, that's, um, um, in my book, you can fix your brain. We start off with the, by the way, it's number one, it was number one in seven categories on Amazon for brain mm -hmm. and brain function. It's really a good book. Absolutely. And we, we talk about bioresonance. Uh, um, I talk about the pyramid of health, that when you have a health concern and you want to figure out not just how do I get rid of the symptoms, but where is this coming from and how do I reverse it? You have to look at it from four different perspectives, like a pyramid. And people say, well, no, a pyramid's got three sides, doesn't it? No, it's got four. There's a base also, the base of the pyramid. That's, the, that's your structure. That's the home of chiropractic and massage and exercise and posture. And are the heels on your shoes worn down? Or do you have flat feet? Or just the, the bones and muscles of the body. That's your structure which can cause any problem. The next side is the biochemical, which is where we focus most of our attention in this society today is, what do I take? What drugs do I take or what vitamins do I take? And it's important, but it's not exclusive. The next side is the emotional or spiritual. And the last side is the electromagnetic. So bioresonance testing, is looking from the electromagnetic side of health to see, is there energy imbalances with this food in terms of how my body responds to it? It's valid, it really helps. We started doing bioresonance in 1984, I think it was. I think it was, I was in my practice in 1980. But, well, I'll tell you the story. It was my third week in my education, so this was the end of January, 1978. And a medical doctor from Los Angeles was coming to talk to our class. I was in Chicago. And he talked about electroacupuncture by Vol, V-O-L-L, -L, who was the godfather of bioresonance. And he said that a woman came in to see him, a 40 something year old woman, and he ran his tests, his bioresonance testing on her. And he said that, um, well, madam, uh, and she had been diagnosed with type two diabetes. And so she came to this weird doctor that she'd heard about to see if could figure out what to do about it. And he ran his tests. Well, ma'am, uh, you've had blood sugar problems most of your life. And, uh, you were very sick as a child and uh, very, very sick. And, uh, and then you've had blood sugar problems most of your life. And it eventually developed into type 2 diabetes. And she said, well, doctor, you're right. I have had blood sugar problems, hypoglycemia uh, forever, even when I was a little kid. Uh, uh, but I was never sick as a child. Oh, yes, you were, ma'am. You had a virus and it settled in your pancreas. 
no, no, no. I was never sick. I didn't have any viral sickness that I know of. Oh, no, you were very sick. No, I wasn't. And he said, is your mother alive? Yes. Call her. He handed her the phone. She called and said, hi, mom. I'm at the doctor's office. Everything's fine. But mom, was I ever sick as a small child? Oh, honey, you almost died. Your fever was 105 and a half. And the doctor was out of town. They lived in some small town. And we put you in ice baths and we soaked your socks in vinegar. We were doing everything we could think of. Uh, yeah, you were really sick. This machine picked it up 40 years later. And this was my third week in my education. I knew absolutely nothing, but I just sat there and I went, what? 40 years earlier, this machine picked up that a virus had settled in her pancreas. And that kind of set the stage for uh, uh, one side of the pyramid of health. The other side of the pyramid of health was the very next week. And Dr. Sheldon Deal was coming to speak on campus, Mr. Arizona. And I said, okay, the guy's a bodybuilder. He's gonna be healthy. I'll go listen to him speak. So he sets up a color te television on a stand in the room, turns it on, but turns the volume off. You know, and color televisions were pretty new still in 1978. They were a fancy thing that not many pe people had. And uh, he went over to his briefcase and opened it up, took out a bar magnet the size of an iPhone, held it up like this, and walked up to the color television. The picture turned upside down. And he walked away and it went right side up again. And he walked towards it and it went upside down. And he walked away and it went right side up again. And he said, that's what electromagnetic pollution does to your brain and your nervous system. It's called neurological switching. And those are people that say right when they mean left. They write the number three backwards. They know I before E except after C, but they misspell it. And they know it really, well, what did I do that for? They're switched. It's called neurological switching. And so I sat there the week before I'd heard about this electromagnetic thing, this uh, bioresonance thing. And then that week I was hearing about electromagnetics. And back then they were talking about the danger of batteries in your watch and having a battery next to your skin. That was the extent of electromagnetic pollution that they were talking about in 1978 and giving us warnings about. Now we've got much more powerful batteries that we put right next to our brain. Or we wear these earbuds that have little batteries in them and we put them next to our brain. Oh, they're okay, they're just so small, they're not a problem. Okay, okay. But that's, uh, so your question about bioresonance and does the testing work? Yeah, it's helpful, it's helpful. Personally, I like looking at the immune system. Your immune system is the armed forces there to protect you, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. When it's elevated trying to protect you from dairy, you got a problem with dairy. You can't negotiate with that one. Your immune system's making elevated antibodies to a food, whether it's soy or eggs or wheat or lectins. If your immune system is fighting the food, you're using your precious energy to fight a food. And that energy is needed to fight viruses and bacteria. Inflammation's not bad for you. Excessive inflammation is bad for you. So stop putting things in your body that your immune system is having to fight. So we, we like looking at the immune system more than bioresonance testing for food sensitivities. That doesn't diminish the value of bioresonance, but I like to uh, see hard evidence and I consider uh, blood tests for the immune system, as long as the technology is good, that's why we're so happy with the lab that we're using now because they're the very best in the world. As long as you can count on the technology, there's nothing that compares with measuring antibodies, as long as you have a competent immune system. Michelle, anything you want to add to that? No, that was a great summary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Suzanne from Instagram. I have a concussion, terrible headaches, 
facial pain, no brain bleed. It's been one week. Any advice? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Find a cranial sacral practitioner right away and get on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle right away. Because uh, when you have a concussion, it causes leaky brain. You've heard of leaky gut. You get a leaky brain. And um, that's the problem with football players. Not that you're a football player, but uh, 99% of NFL football players, when they do exams on MRIs on them, they've got chronic traumatic encephalopathies. They've got lots of problems with the brain because they were hit so often. Uh, uh, and it's something, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the number. I think it was in the 40 percentiles of college football players and in the 20 percentile of high school football players that when they're in their 50s and 60s, they're diagnosed with CTE or they show evidence of CTE. So you don't wanna mess with a concussion. And the first thing you wanna do is reduce the inflammation in your lifestyle. Be as squeaky clean as you can in terms of what you put in there. The most common source of environmental triggers creating inflammation is what's on the end of your fork. So be really conscious of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle right now. And Michelle, if she was going to live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, what does that mean? So it's all encompassing, Dr. Tom. It's really having anti-inflammatory thoughts in our head. So critically important, right? Stinking thinking wreaks havoc on our health. So that's number one. And then the food that you were talking about. So really it's eating whole, real nutrient dense food as organic or biodynamic as possible. So it's avoiding stuff out of a bag, a box, a can, a jar, all the processed stuff uh, as much as possible. Now there's sometimes that, you know, I have a can of something, maybe tomato sauce. Um, actually, I try to use that in a jar because the acidic uh, tomato. So I just got some today that was uh, in a jar and I needed it for ingredients and a recipe. But for the most part, if you could go pick tomatoes out of your garden and turn them into a sauce, that would be ideal. Um, so avoiding sugar, gluten, you know, the foods that we talked about earlier, and then really minimizing toxins. So think about what we put on our skin, what we wash our clothes in, what we track in on the bottom of our shoes, into our house, uh, what we wash our dishes in. So just go through, get on the environmental working group. And when you're in standing in that line in um, Whole Foods or Sprouts or wherever you're getting your um, non-toxic cleaners and look them up on environmental working group or go to Thrive Market. Does the doctor.com have a Thrive Market link? We've got, uh, uh, there is a Thrive Market link. We'll put it in here. There's also a link for trulyfreehome.com. Uh, they, they used to be called My Green Fills and they changed their name. They've got the best. We did a Facebook Live with Stephen, the president, uh, about two years ago, I think now. And he showed the, the veggie wash that they use. You take a thing of broccoli, you know, you come home from the... Uh, uh, store, you bought broccoli, and if it's not organic, that's all they had was conventional. Uh, you know, he pours some of his stuff in a little bucket of water in the sink. He dips it in there, swishes it around. He did half of it, swished it around, rinsed it off, and you could see that half the broccoli, it, the color was different. It's because the wax, they put wax on the vegetables. So it washed off the waxes. It washes off over 94% of the insecticides and pesticides. So if you're not buying organic, you go to Truly Free Home. We'll, we'll put the link here for you. And you, you get their veggie wash. And so that as much as possible, you're eating organic. And when you can't, you're, you're washing your fruits and vegetables in that veggie wash that they've got. And as Michelle said, for your cleaners, your laundry detergent, they've got great laundry detergent. They have saved literally now millions of bottles of plastic that they have in ship. Cause they, they send you your first dish of uh, um, uh, laundry detergent in you know, the big plastic container thing, right? But the refills, they send in recyclable plastic. 
and then you just pour it into the heavy duty plastic thing. So you just keep it. You don't throw it out when it's empty. You just pour in the new detergent in there. So you've got your dispenser, but this one that they shipped it in is compostable. It's safe for your garden, right? And millions of bottles that they've saved now, plastic bottles that they haven't shipped for refills. Great company, look them up. You'll feel good that you're contributing a little bit to the planet when you do that. Yeah, I uh, love, love their products, they're great. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about, uh, uh, what about uh, uh, water? Uh, it was Diana, uh, distilled water. What about distilled water? You know, our water is so toxic now, full of chemicals and uh, pharmaceuticals. I mean, women, you know, millions of women taking estrogen in a city, it's in their urine and it doesn't get filtered out. And so there's residues of estrogens and testosterones and uh, the hormones that people are taking in the drinking water. It does not get filtered out. So when you use distilled water, it's a much safer water, cleaner water, but the distillation process takes out the minerals. And so like reverse osmosis takes out the metals and the minerals, distilled water takes out everything. And so it's very clean water, safe water to drink, but it doesn't have any building blocks to it. So you have to make sure to supplement with minerals if you're using distilled water. Michelle, are there any minerals that you have um, as a favorite that you like? I really like Elite. Um, it just has three, um, sodium, magnesium, potassium. Um, so it's very basic, right? But it's the exact ratio of those ingredients in human blood. And I find that that's a really great um, product for most people. Um, Body Bio also has um, a mixed um, mineral. And I think there's a couple other companies. There's a bottle I'm visualizing it in blue. I don't know the name of the company, but I like liquids that can be added back into the water um, because I feel like that can disperse into all the water and then be absorbed at the cellular level. But there's an epidemic of dehydration out there, even for people who are drinking a lot of water. So if you're drinking, let's say you drink 16 ounces of water really quickly, think about how soon you urinate. And if it's in within about a half an hour, it could be that you're dehydrated and the water isn't actually able to penetrate the cell because you don't have enough electrolytes. And so that's, I look at markers like BUN creatinine ratio, if that's 20 or above, that indicates dehydration. There's some markers on a CBC with diff. And then I ask those questions because like you've taught me, Dr. Tom, body language doesn't lie. So we've got to listen to our symptoms. People who are up all night urinating, that is not normal. Your body needs to sleep and rest. And so it could be as simple as making sure you have adequate electrolytes or a good mineral complex. I want to give a shout out to Bill Haney, who answered the question about uh, distilled water. He typed in the answer, do not abandon mineral content absent from distilled water. Good point, Bill, and I think we covered it, but thank you so much for putting that uh, on there. Uh, that was great. Um, Iola asks on Instagram, what about ionization water? That's a good concept, that's helpful. Uh, there, there are a number of different types of water. Alkaline water is a good concept. Ionization water is a good concept. Uh, difficult to say that one is best. The, the, the one water that I think is best is the one that's the cleanest for you, meaning not a lot of toxins in it. That's most important. And um, hopefully we get most of our minerals and our electrolytes from the organic produce that we're eating, lots of. That's the goal, you know, to be moving in that direction. Yes. Michelle, anything you want to add to that one? Um, I worry about alkaline water consumed during meals because we need our stomach to be highly That's acidic to digest mm -hmm. our food. And so I don't think we should be drinking copious amounts of water when we're eating anyway. If you need a couple of sips, 
to take supplements. I think it's great to chew a bite because it forces you to chew it really well and then swallow the supplement with that bite of food. And that just avoids adding water in. Water's great first thing in the morning and in between meals. Um, and then if you're urinating at night, just cut it off at four, cut it off at three, cut it off at two, figure out what you need to do so that you're not up all night urinating. Um, but I would really be careful about having um, alkaline water at mealtimes. It's a very good point. Very good point. Uh, let's see. My wife has LPR. Do you have recommendations? Yes. Uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux. It's kind of a silent reflux. And um, it's like any other digestive problem. You have to figure out where is it coming from. And of course, the top of the list is what foods is she eating that her immune system is fighting? Just you know, Google gluten and reflux or dairy and reflux. And here come the studies. Well, should I give up gluten? I don't know. You should do the test to find out. So as Michelle started off the show with, you know, I would do the lectin zoomer, the wheat zoomer, the dairy zoomer, the egg zoomer, the corn zoomer. Now, if she never eats eggs, then don't do the egg zoomer. There's no need if she doesn't eat it. But you have to find out what is the trigger that's causing the digestive upset. And it, the first on the list is foods. The second on the list is bacterial infections. Uh, uh, Heliobacter is notorious for that. Uh, Heliobacter is commonly thought to primarily be um, a high concentration in the stomach. And it causes reflux um, quite often for people. So it might be bacterial infection. It might be mold in your house. She's breathing mold and that's doing it. There's a number of things it could be, Benjamin. Uh, the question is, what is it? And for that, the rule is test, don't guess. And once you see what your immune system is fighting, then it's easy. You deal with whatever that thing is. If you have to fight it to get rid of it, like bacteria or viruses, all right, then you do that. Or if it's food, you get the food out of there. You just have to figure out what's the trigger that's causing this digestive imbalance. Michelle, and anything you want to add to that one? 100% of the time, it is not a protein pump inhibitor deficiency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do not do that. There are too many side effects, nasty side effects to that. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that don't do it. Uh, I'm not your doctor. I can't tell you what to do or not do. It's just that the uh, 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 antacids that people are given uh, are not the cause of the vast majority of symptoms they have. They feel a little better when they take it, but they're causing so much havoc in their digestive tract down the road. Uh, the side effects are notoriously bad. Mm -hmm. We have to digest protein in our stomach. And so we need acid to do that. And so the number of food sensitivities skyrockets and the box actually says on it, don't take for longer than two weeks. So it breaks my heart when people that I'm working with have been on it for years. But if, if that's what's being recommended to you, um, look into the root cause first, if you're already on it, uh, work with somebody who can help you figure out the root cause. So you don't need to be on it the rest of your life. Yes. Yes. Uh, Julie's on Zoom. Dr. Tom discussed damage to the cerebellum due to gluten in the past. I definitely have damage to the cerebellum, poor balance, ataxia, means she can't walk straight, but thought it was due to lupus. Anyway, how do you reverse and increase balance besides already doing balance exercises including whole body vibration and avoiding all gluten. You're on the right track with the whole body vibration. That's a good thing. Uh, mini trampolines are excellent. And you, they've got them for elders that have a stabilization bar in the front of it. So you hold on to it and then you're just walking on the trampoline because it's the proprioception. That is the messaging from the bottom of your feet going up to your brain that's telling you how to walk. And that whole communication system is worn out right now. That's what ataxia means, is that your brain's not sending the message down. Imagine you're walking on a hill. You're, you're walking um, sideways on the hill, not going up or down, along the side of the hill. And one foot's up a little higher than the other foot. 
When you're walking like that on the hill, muscles on the inside of one leg are working differently than muscles on the inside of the other leg because there's a different height. So different parts of the muscles are working. And then as you push off, different parts of the muscles are working on each leg separately. It's different than when you're walking flat on a surface. Well, how does the body know what muscles to turn on and turn off when you're walking? When it doesn't do it very well, that's called ataxia. Yeah, you can't walk very well. Well, how does the body know? It's the messages on the bottom of your feet called proprioception that sends the message up the nerves to the brain, to the cerebellum, and the brain decides what to do and sends a message back down to your muscles. Okay, muscle on the inside of the right leg, you tighten up a little bit because you're putting weight forward. You're pushing off on that big toe right now. And muscles on the other leg, you lighten up a little bit because you're, you're like reaching out. So all of that communication happens from the bottom of your feet. So when you get on a trampoline, a mini trampoline, if, you sit, if you're watching television at night, you're on a trampoline watching television every night. Well, but I'm tired. Okay, fine. Walk anyway. And you just walk nice and slow. You don't have to work up a sweat. You're just working the bottoms of your feet. You put on a pair of socks, you know, so that you cushion your feet a little bit. And you're just rolling your feet. You're feeling that slow walk, rolling your heel to the big toe, pushing off. Roll, push off on the big toe, push off on the big toe. And you're doing it every day. And in a few months, you're walking a little bit better because you're building the proprioception communication system back up. That's the first thing you do. No, that's the second thing. The first thing you do is identify inflammation in the brain and get the inflammatory triggers out of there, which means you do the neural zoomer plus to figure out how much inflammation is in my brain right now. And then you identify the triggers of that inflammation. You may be gluten-free, which is great, but do the wheat zoomer to see if what you're doing is working. And if you're not taking wheat rescue or E3 advanced plus with every meal that you're not making at home from scratch, you aren't taking the protective enzymes, I will wager you $100, your test comes back positive that you've got elevated antibodies to gluten. And in my practice, I looked at 300, oh, what was the number? Gosh, I think it was 326, but I'm not remembering how many patients it was. I haven't talked about it in a, in a year or more, but it was over 300 patients. Every patient that came in, um, they, they got this test done. And 26% of everybody that had elevated antibodies to gluten also had elevated antibodies to the cerebellum, the balance center in the brain. And what this person is experiencing right now is their cerebellum's not working so well anymore. And they've got ataxia, they can't walk very well. My good friend has that going on right now. And I said to, cause I watched him walk one day, he said, you're having a hard time walking, aren't you? He said, well, yeah, a little bit. And I said, and how is it buttoning your shirt? And he just looked at me and said, well, I'm having a hard time. I said, no kidding. How many years have I been telling you to stop eating gluten? You know, <laughs> he's my good friend, so I could get in his face about it, right? Okay, 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 I'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> so I don't know if he did or not, but, but that's the mechanism that's going on. So the first thing you have to do is confirm if the inflammation in the brain is minimal, which I doubt it is if you haven't done this work already uh, and do the wheat zoomer to confirm that you have to learn more about how to protect yourself from gluten, even if you are being gluten-free. Michelle, anything you want to add to that one? Yes, I took the name off of this test. This is somebody, test results for a wheat zoomer of somebody on a gluten-free diet for 12 years. Wow, yes, so yes. we can think that we're doing a good job. And unless we get a report card, we don't know. We just don't know, Dr. Tom. And that's why this test, that's why we bring it up so often because there's 300 diseases and symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease and wheat sensitivity, 300. 
Yes. So like Dr. Tom says, it's absurd to say that everything's caused by gluten, but it's very rational to say if you have any symptoms, you've got to rule gluten out. Right. So if you think you're on a gluten-free diet, just check. That's a really startling test result. Glad to see that you, you uh, had that there. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then I just want to also sh um, share this. Not every rebounder is created equal, and you could get a rebounder that could possibly injure you. Uh, the Bellicon is probably the Bentley of rebounders. It's on the pricier side, but I think on um, Black Friday, they have a sale. So this maybe could be your Christmas present you asked for. But there's a couple companies that are good quality, but some of them could actually end up injuring your joints. I just want you to make sure it's got the stabilization bar. This one, does, you can add it on. Oh, you can. Good. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kim on Facebook says, I started having tooth sensitivity and nerve pain about a month ago. I did a cone bean x-ray last week, which showed no infection or cracks. I'm also taking supplements, including biocide and probiotics for H. pylori, along with the detox, detox diet. My sinuses are slightly congested, but is there anything else I'm missing or could any supplements cause this? My dentist is a naturopath. That sounds great, Kim. You've got... Um, You've got a comprehensive, sounds like you have a comprehensive dentist there uh, and you're taking biocidin. I'm assuming that also means you're taking dental sidin, which is the biocidin toothpaste and the biocidin uh, mouthwash. Um, I'm assuming that's the case. And you're asking what else can you take? Uh, bi biocidin for the H. pylori. Um, I would start there, but make sure you're retesting within six weeks for H. pylori. Uh, if it's going to work, it'll work within that time. Uh, that's a usual amount of time. Some H. pylori now is very uh, antibiotic resistant. And uh, I've seen a few cases that are also biocidin resistant. Hard to imagine what they are. Uh, so uh, uh, the the strength of some of these bugs, they develop, you know, and they're, they're getting stronger. So I would just want to check that and make, make sure that you dealt with the H. pylori successfully. That's the first thing. Michelle, would you add to that? Yes. So she says, my sinuses are slightly congested. So I recommend talking to your doctor to see if they could order Marcon's testing. So mm -hmm. it's, Used to be people would freak out about it, but everyone's done so many COVID tests and shoved that Q-tip up in their nose. Now they're like, oh, it's no big deal. So these are things that can be found up in the sinuses that are leaking down into your mouth, into your gut, and then leaking out of your gut system wide. Mm -hmm. So that is a test that sometimes I find that is the missing link for somebody not completely getting well. Good catch, really good catch. Uh, D in Instagram says, what is this panel? I'm not sure what you're referring to, D. Michelle, did you know what she's referring to? What is this panel? I'm not sure. We've talked about a few panels, so I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Yeah, post Jeff, again, D. we're happy to yeah. answer. Yeah, Jeff's on Zoom says, how to improve breathing, have COPD and celiac, low carb diet, keto, hard to walk around without inhaler, thanks. Uh, first thing, Jeff, um, uh, check your foods. Uh, as Michelle was talking about the uh, Zoomer packages, check your foods uh, to make sure to confirm that nothing you're eating is triggering the inflammation, which may manifest in you as COPD. It easily could be a strong contributor. Second to that, uh, one of the things that I take and I know many people have taken and have said good things about is the product called Lung Support. We'll put a link here for you. They're adaptogenic herbs that do a remarkable job of protecting people during this time of viral crisis. Lots and lots of testimonials of how wonderful they are. And not just for the virus, but with breathing difficulties of many types, including COPD. Can't hurt, a little bit of a shotgun approach, uh, but very safe and often very effective. 
Michelle, anything you'd want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, they probably already have an air purifier. I'm trying to think mold. I maybe would uh, do an ERMI test mm -hmm. to see if there's any mold. Um, yeah, I would work with a functional medicine practitioner to help you figure this out because yes. I think that you don't have to be living like this. Yeah, and uh, Michelle's absolutely right. Critical to consider mold. And there's a urine test that looks for the exhaust of mold in your body. And there's a blood test that looks at, is your immune system fighting mold? And we'll post the links in here for both of those. The, the blood test is, is that, is it the fungal zoomer? Is that what it's called? Uh, the yeah. blood test is the fungal zoomer. Fungal zoomer. Yeah. And then uh, Great Plains, uh, the urine test, uh, mycotoxin panel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I uh, definitely check those to see. Uh, if you have a high concentration of mold in your body that may be settling in your lungs. Uh, hi, Tom and Michelle. This is Aurelia from South Carolina. Hey, Aurelia on Facebook. What are your thoughts on using methylene blue for mitochondrial health? My practitioner wants me to take it, but it concerns me because it's synthetic. Uh, I have no experience with uh, uh, taking methylene blue for mitochondrial health. And personally, I wouldn't do it. Uh, but I, I guess I'm giving you my opinion. You asked for my opinion. I wouldn't do it. Uh, if you want mitochondrial help, uh, there are so many things you can do. I've just downloaded 47 studies. It took me uh, almost two hours to download these studies on fasting mimicking diets and the benefits of fasting mimicking diets across the board. I'm on the medical advisory board for the company that has pioneered this called Prolong. And it is so impressive, the science that's come out now. On You do this five-day program called Prolong, P-R-O-L-O-N. We'll put the link in here for you. And you're eating foods three, four times a day, but they supply you with the food. And it's not a lot of food. And for some people, on day two, it's a little bit of, yeah, you know, I could eat a little more. I'm a little bit hungry. Not much, but a little bit. But after that, you're fine. Day three, you feel better. Day four, you feel better. Day five, you feel great. And then it's time to phase back in again. And the studies are now out. There are a number of studies that show you do that three times in a row, once a month, three times in a row. Don't do anything else different in your lifestyle. The rest of the time, your cholesterol comes down, your triglycerides come down, your insulin resistance goes down, your insulin sensitivity goes up, your, your energy goes way up because what you're doing in this fasting mimicking diet is you're stimulating your body. It's, it's an it's a, uh, uh, adaptation mechanism from our ancestors. When they couldn't find enough food, they better get some energy to go out there and go hunt for food. So how did they do that? It's called mitophagy. Mitophagy means let's get rid of all of the old and damaged mitochondria. Let's just get rid of that garbage mitochondria that's not working very well and make new mitochondria. Mitochondria are the furnaces in every cell of your body. And it was a survival mechanism for us that when we didn't have food for a couple of days, usually around day three, it would start. You didn't have any food. You got water, but you don't have any food. Your body, to get some energy, starts building more energy-producing cells. And it cleans up the old and damaged cells, gets, just gets rid of them. It's called mitophagy. And one of the goals of being healthier and younger and living longer, more productive lives is to enhance mitophagy, enhance your body's ability to make the furnaces that give you energy in every cell of your body. And now we know without doubt that doing these prolonged protocol three times in a row, one month apart, has long-term benefits up to six months later. You're still seeing the benefits six months later. And they're doing these studies with diabetics, with nephritis patients, with cancer patients, um, with cognitive decline patients. And across the board, they're showing benefit and no side effects. 
very safe and easy to do. So uh, the answer to the question about mitochondrial health, there's two things I would do. I would do prolon three times in a row, and I would be looking to increase my urolithin levels. Mm -hmm. Urolithin is a um, exhaust of good bacteria in your gut. And this is why pomegranates and pomegranate juice, you may remember, gosh, 10, 15 years ago, those little bottles of pomegranate juice, fat on the bottom, they taper up little bottles. Uh, and lots of studies came out showing how great it was for you in many different ways. Well, now we know the mechanism. Pomegranates help to produce urolithin A. And so there's new products coming out soon. They're not out yet, but they're coming out pretty soon that are natural sources of urolithin A. Uh, uh, in the meantime, there's one product out there, MitoPure, M-I-T-O-P-U-R-E. MitoPure is a source of urolithin A for mitochondrial health, but it's got some preservative in it. You know, it, and I, I'm being a little, a little uh, fanatical here about it, but I don't want to take it because of the preservatives that are in it. But it works. People get energy. Their muscles are functioning better and all that. Uh, but do a little reading about urolithin A and how to support a healthy, diverse microbiome to produce more. That's the Michelle, one I take. Oh, there you go. Urolithin A right there. Oh, Can marvelous. Oh, I and didn't know about this product. a resveratrol little CoQ10. Oh, that's um, a great product. It's super clean, not yeah. even magnesium stearate. And so Pure, this Pure could, Encapsulation is a, is a good company. They're a high yeah. quality company. And maybe it could be added to the doctor.com store. I think it could be. Mm -hmm. And we'll take care of that. <laughs> good. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're 10 minutes over the hour. You know, and we're still just getting started here. There's a bunch more questions. Sorry, we can't get to them all um, uh, as much as we'd like to. Uh, but, you know, I've got to say hello to Gracie and the Benson family. Hey, Gracie. Gracie's our little nine-year-old, maybe 10 now, maybe 10-year-old who watches us every week. Uh, and her mother, Quincy, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, from your farm in Iowa watching us. We always love to know you're out there. So thank you for that. And uh, Michelle, thanks so much for being here tonight. It's always fun to do this together. So much fun, Dr. Tom. Thanks so much for including me. And I look forward to December, first Tuesday in December. Yes, yes. Thanks, everyone.